I'm Noah Arsenault uh, from the School of Journalism and Media Studies, making this video for comics at SDSU. We are going to be talking to Professor Jess Whatcott um, about their class and learning a little bit more about the class and about comics in general. So first of all, Jess, why don't you introduce yourself and then do you collect comics? What kinds of things do you collect? And just a little bit about that, and then we'll talk about the class. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Jess Watcott. I am an assistant professor of gender and sexuality studies at San Diego State University. I'm affiliated with the Center for Comic Studies. I teach in LGBTQ plus studies at the university. And I'm really excited that this class is merging those two things. Um, Queering Comics will um, be is a new class that is thinking about the ways that comics have been a central part of queer culture and community throughout the 20th century. And also the ways that fears about uh, queer and trans people have contributed to some of the backlash against comics and the creation of the Comics Code Authority. And then also the class looks at how comics have come out in the 21st century with new queer and trans um, uh, and bisexual characters. Uh, there's also a, the class also looks at how graphic narratives have exploded in the past few years, especially with many queer and trans um, artists and creators writing memoirs um, or speculative fiction. Uh, so it's a really exciting time for to be looking at comics through uh, a queer and trans lens. I personally came to comics uh, in the 90s through the X-Men animated series <laughs> that was in the 1990s. And that's how I got introduced to the X-Men and the characters and the plot lines of the comics. And it was only later that I actually read the comic books, the X-Men comic books. Um, and then uh, in college, I was when I first learned about queer comics like Dykes to Watch Out For. Um, I was a big fan of Hothead, Paisan, Homicidal, Lesbian Maniac. <laughs> Um, and other underground and indie comics that were really important to the queer community. I became friends with uh, queer and trans comics creators, um, got introduced to some collections like the Gay Genius, Genius Collection, um, Genius, <laughs> Gay Genius. <laughs> uh, and now I'm a huge fan of all of the uh, graphic narratives. I, I teach uh, graphic theories in my class um, and also graphic memoirs uh, and graphic speculative fiction. So I'm a huge collector of that of that work. What would you say to encourage someone to take the class who says, I'm not interested in queer or trans issues. Those aren't relevant to me. I'm a member of a overrepresented group let's say, uh -huh. why, why would I take such a class? Do you, do you have an answer for that? I do actually. So there's there's a way that you can tell the story of comics through looking through um, the lens of gender and sexuality. So it was, you know, if you're interested in learning, for example, about the creation of the Comics Code Authority, uh, fears about gender and sexuality were central to the creation of the Comics Code Authority. So fears about uh, how Wonder Woman <laughs> was representing kink and BDSM themes and undermining the you know, heterosexual nuclear family. Uh, fears about Batman and Robin being uh, the early Batman and Robin's comics uh, having this gay subtext, uh, that directly testimony about those kinds of fears led directly to the creation of the comic code authorities. So understanding this arc of censorship and how it structured, you know, led to the over reliance of the superhero theme 
versus other kinds of uh, co uh, horror comics and other comics that were um, popular in the early 20th century and also how uh, you know the rise of independent and underground comics to counter uh, the Comics Code Authority. Um, you can uh, understand all of those issues by looking through this gender and sexuality lens. That is a great answer. And I'm not just saying that, but that's a great answer. And uh, I'm familiar with a little bit about the concerns about Batman and Robin, which seems almost comical to us today. But I guess there are people actually concerned that this is teaching the wrong things uh, to people. Um, do you want to talk about a few specific comics that might be covered in the class or anything else you want to talk about? I mean, um, but are there a few specific graphic novels or books that you focus on in the class? Yeah, so one of the things, so the class, I'm a person who studies history, so it will definitely take a bit of a historical arc looking at um, looking at the rise of the Comics Code Authority and how queer comics moved underground to uh, in, in gay and lesbian bookstore, were sold in gay and lesbian bookstores as a way to uh, create uh, LGBTQ community and culture. Um, but we're also going to look more recently at the ways that um, comics and graphic narratives have become the target of a new cultural backlash against uh, queer and trans people. So one example of that is the graphic memoir, Gender Queer um, by Maya Kobe. And they the the book is uh, all about um, coming into the author's gender identity um, as a non non-binary person. It has been one of the number one banned books in America for the past few years um, because parents have asked schools to pull it from library shelves. Um, because they argue that it depicts explicit sex. Um, if you actually read the book, which we'll do in the class, there are approximately three pains in the whole <laughs> book that, that have actual depictions of sex. And they are, what we'll do in the class is we'll look at those pains and analyze why they're important to the story um, and uh, tr try to understand um, the ways that the backlash is completely missing the, the point of the book, <laughs> which is that this person didn't see a lot of representations of them out in the world. And so they wanted to create a story that could help and has helped a lot of young people understand more about themselves. Um, so the backlash is actually pulling this book that um, many young people have said has been really helpful to understanding who they are. I, I've, he I've heard of that book and I knew that that was a, a particular one for, for people to target. Um, is, there, is there something else that students might read in the class or? Yeah, we also in the class, we're going to look at uh, how some mainstream comics have uh, recently come out as queer. <laughs> so there are a lot of um, current comics, uh, Angela Asgard's Assassin, World of Wakanda, um, uh, different strands of the X-Men, uh, all new uh the all new X-Men, there are multiple characters who have for a long time been read uh, as queer characters or, or you know, queer LGBTQ audiences have interpreted these characters as maybe being part of the community, part of the family. Okay. Um, but now in the past few years, they've explicitly come out. So Bobby Iceman got his first kiss in the all new X-Men, a character that a long time ha uh, people have read as uh read as gay and there's been a lot of fanfic created about bobby um in world of wakanda io and okoye have a lesbian relationship 
There's a trans character and Angela Asgard's assassin. So we're going to be looking at these, um, you know, why uh, at the after the end of the Comics Code Authority, how mainstream comics have felt uh, free to uh, actually explicitly name these characters as um, queer and trans. I have a question because uh, I'm also a historian. I study radio. Um, comic books are just for fun. But um, it's always challenging to identify the first, right? There's always debates about the first. <laughs> but in your area of study, is there one character who came out first or not just read or interpreted, but like, I think there was a character in Alpha Flight, but uh, maybe there was earlier than that. Yeah, I, I can't answer that question, but there there are older characters. One of the things I will be looking at in the class is how for a long time, there were more explicit LGBTQ characters who are villains in comics. Okay. And it was more comfortable to have villains who were LGBTQ because they, you know, can subvert the cultural norms. Um, but we'll be analyzing, you know, what are the consequences of that for LGBTQ people if your only representation is as a bad guy? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I could see that being associated with something uh, negative or, you know, contrary. Um, was there anything else you want to say in conclusion? Anything we missed? Any book that we didn't talk about that is your personal favorite? So one other thing that is interesting is the way that comics have been used to communicate information in queer community. So one of the other things we'll be looking at in the class is this comics competition uh, called Visual AIDS. Um, and they have an annual strip AIDS uh, competition where they invite creators to create comics that educate community about HIV AIDS. And we're gonna have some, hopefully have some of the participants in that competition come and, and talk about using comics to as a very accessible medium for communicating prevention uh information and uh talk about important issues in the lgbtq community so uh comics have been used not just for entertainment but also for um sharing inform important information all right that's a great great note to end on um comics uh like all forms of media can be used in a variety of ways and we shouldn't think about them in one particular way um well thanks for all the information and the title of the class once again and the number it's queering comics lgbt 550 all right well uh, let everyone know to look out for it thanks so much